So I'm going to give you a quick update on uh, the Elixir uh, language just at its core, um, what's been going on for the last six months, what's going to happen in the next six months, and maybe what's going to happen a bit beyond that as well. Uh, so this is Elixir. This is our GitHub page. We've got quite a few uh, repos as well as uh, the Elixir language itself. Um, these are all managed by the core team and with some help from others as well. You can see we've got 15 people associated with the language at the moment and five different teams. Um, the language started in 2011. Jose did his first commit. Uh, it was an object-orientated language at the time. It wasn't a functional language. Things changed pretty quickly. And by about 2012, 2013, it was functional. Pro good progress was being made. Uh, Jose presented at an Erlang factory in Krakow. And um, by 2014, we had our very first version. And we had 3.4 thousand GitHub stars, because everyone knows you measure your success by your GitHub stars. <laughs> and as you can see, our success uh, in that terms has been growing every year. Uh, and we've had two releases recently um, every year. And now Codebeam 2018, we've just released version 1.6. Uh, in January. Uh, so we follow semantic versioning. What that means is we have three numbers, the major, the minor, and the patch version. We're still on one, which means we haven't had any breaking changes since our version one release. The next is the minor version. That means um, it gets incremented every time there's a new feature added. Um, but it must be uh, backwards compatible if the major version hasn't changed. And then we have patch versions. Um, Unfortunately, we've had quite a few patch versions since January already because um, there's been a few bugs. Uh, so I think we're on about version 1.6.3 at the moment. Um, we do have a statement in the Elixir uh, language about um, what a breaking change is. And occasionally, because it's a language, uh, a bug fix may actually break your code. And this has happened a couple of times. Um, Obviously, we don't want to get stuck in the situation where we have a, to keep uh, bugs and treat them as features, because that's uh, what's happened. Um, so occasionally, there will be breaking changes, very, very occasionally. <laughs> but we do our best not to do them. Uh, Elixir is really focusing on three things, productivity, maintainability, and reliability. And we do inherit a lot of these from Erlang, especially the reliability part. Um, we do try to bring some extras around productivity and maintainability by lessening the, the learning curve and providing lots and lots of extra helpers. Sometimes these helpers may get in the way for more experienced users. OK. The first big feature for version 1.6 was the formatter. Uh, this allows you to format your code with just mix format, or you can use other functions as well. Uh, the idea behind this is that everyone's code looks the same. It takes away the discussion about what your code should look like. This is especially useful for new users of the language, because the syntax may be unfamiliar. They may be unsure what's a clear way to, to write the code they want to write. And the formatter <laughs> provides a very quick feedback loop, because you can just run mix format, and then you get your code looking how it should look. I think um, everyone's experienced um, some nice, nice things with the formatter, and everyone's had a few disagreements. So on the whole, I think people are generally happy that everyone's code is going to look the same. Uh, so th this is how you can format your code. Uh, this is a before. This, is, this was formatted in the Elixir language itself. This is how you define a module. It's actually just a macro. There's not that much magic behind defining a module. And then afterwards, Slightly prettier, a bit more white space. If you do do the 1.6 format, you get to add thousands of lines to your contributions because we add lots of white space. <laughs> but that's actually a bad thing because really you want to delete code, so you don't want to be the one to do that. Okay, there's very little configuration. If you ask for configuration, you'll be turned away because the idea is that there shouldn't be a discussion around how the formatter works. There's just line length. And it shouldn't change the meaning of your code. This means the AST, the abstract syntax tree, must stay the same, which is quite a challenge for Elixir, because it has a more complicated syntax than Erlang does. OK, this is uh, 
sort of uh, an introduction to the abstract tree. This is a, a pretty simple module. It's defining a function, and it's got a quoted expression. And then this is what the quoted abstract tree looks like underneath. What uh, the formatter does is it goes through this. It works out where, based on the context, how the code should be formatted, and then returns it again. Uh, there is a way you can test that the abstract uh, quoted expressions haven't changed um, just to be on the safe side. And Elixir runs this every time you commit to the language. Uh, so what, what happens is you have a string, it gets tokenized, it gets parsed, and then you can uh, get a quoted expression. And this is how simple this is. This is the, quoted, uh, the actual code in Elixir itself for doing a quoted expression. OK, the compiler. Uh, we've got macros in Elixir, lots of metaprogramming that you don't get in Erlang. This causes much more complex uh, compilation, because if one module changes, another module may need to change as well, much like if you have a parse transform in Erlang, except you can have many more macros, and you can have code calling other code inside those macros. So you, it can be a nightmare when you change one module and you just watch your whole project uh, have to recompile. Uh, and you can see the dependencies uh, with mix xref, xref graph. This was introduced a few years ago. And in 1.6, we built on this so you can understand why these long compile times are happening, because you want to be productive. You want to, get, uh, you want to get the results of your compilation as fast as possible. Uh, so we've got format stats. This allows you a quick overview of the troublemakers. See, top 10 outmost going dependencies. If you change ecto.query in ecto, you cause a lot of uh, compiling to occur. You can get uh, very low level details about your um, call graph, <coughs> compile time, runtime, and struct dependencies. A struct dependency is a new special case separated from compile time, because if you add a key in your struct, you can often do much more efficient recompilation. OK, we also added attributes for deprecated and since. If you've been confused by the name of this conference, which has changed every year the last two years, this should give you an idea how this attribute works. <laughs> yeah. And we've got def guard as well, which allows you to define your own guard using a macro. Right uh, before we introduced this feature, there was a limited number of functions that you can call in a guard, and this is still the case. This doesn't let you add new functions. It allows you to compose your guard so you can do many checks and then reuse the same guard in multiple places. OK, testing. We added uh, a feature which allows you to find the slowest tests uh, when you're running your tests. This is nice because often about 20% of tests slow you down. And this runs that doesn't run them concurrently, so you get the sequential speed. So it's, it is actually slower to find the slowest tests, but once you've nailed them down, you can easily work on what needs to be fixed. But as you can see, I think this is plug, and as you can see, all the, the slowest test is only just over 120 milliseconds, so it's still like very fast. OK, supervise. Uh, this is a supervisor. The supervisor is the one with, the, with like the hard hat on, because it's trapping exits, and then we've got our good processes. And then if we have a bad process, we're restarting them. We've got four of these types of supervisors. Um, Elixir uses Erlang's gen server supervisor underneath. It's all the same OTP. However, Elixir users were struggling with simple one for one, because it's not really that simple. The other three supervisors. Um, have the same behavior, and then simple one for one mixes things up a bit, so maybe it should be called something different. Um, so we have in 1.5 introduced a child spec function. This is a helper um, to help you uh, build your child specifications. Actually, the OTP team went up to us in uh, one, uh, OTP 18 and introduced maps for child specs, which is much better than what Elixir can do, but for backwards compatibility, we can't fix to use theirs, which is a shame, but that's great. And we have started using the maps a little bit. Um, so simple for one for one doesn't work with the child specs we introduced. So we have to introduce something called dynamic supervisor. It works almost exactly the same, except the default arguments stay in the, fr in the 
supervisor and you have passed the child specs in the start child call, so it's the same as the static supervisors. You don't send the arguments to the simple one for one anymore. Okay, we've got Unicode 10 support, which is great. Uh, we've also got enum slice, time add, and some extra compiler diagnostics for those writing tooling such as language servers. Uh, okay, coming soon, 1.7, releases. You will hear more about releases from Paul, so I won't go into too much detail, but Mix is going to support releases. Um, when you do Mix run or IX uh, start Mix, that will actually run your actual release. It won't be different. So you'll be running the same code in your dev environment as uh, in your product environment if that's what you want to do. Uh, and configuration will work nicely. You'll be able to use your mixed config files with releases. You won't have to have overlays and things like, things like that. You can edit your config file after you've built the release. Uh, stream data. We were thinking about bringing this in 1.6. It's a property-based testing tool. It does data generation and property-based testing. Um, there was, this is a very simple property-based testing. It is not expecting to have any advanced features. The reason we want to bring it in is so we can take advantage of property-based testing in the language itself. We don't have to worry about downloading other libraries. We don't have to worry about proprietary code. We don't have to worry about other licenses. It's a very simple property-based testing tool. Uh, but you will be able to use it yourself as well. It's not just for the Elixir core. Okay, research projects. This is what's beyond 1.7. Dialyzer support. This is another tool that originated uh, from Crossis. Um, for Elixir users, it's a little bit awkward because it's in Erlang format. We want to change the, the format of the warnings. Uh, the warnings as well are very explicit and very easy if you know what they mean. But if you don't know what they mean, they are very hard. So we're going to try and add some hints and things like that. Also, managing the persistent lookup table, which stores your types of your dependencies. Mix has a lot of information about that already. So it's going to do that for you. Uh, Sean Cribbs has got a great library. Uh, for using Dialyzer in Elixir, and hopefully we can iterate on that before bringing it into Elixir itself. OK, we also want better compiler errors. You know, in modern languages like Elm and Rust have really, really like, good errors when you fail to compile, like language goals. We really want to improve some of our horrible errors. Like, I know I just said dialyzers could be hard, but we have hard errors as well. Like this error on the screen here. You like, you have to do a lot of work, maybe, to find out where that bug is. And also, we want better documentation. Right now in Elixir, you can do this uh, in your shell. You can look up documentation. You can't do it for Erlang modules. Uh, we've sent a proposal to OTP. And we're going to support storing documentation for any Beam language in the Beam files. And there'll be a consistent API for you to read the documentation everywhere. <laughs> OK. And um, I just want to say a quick welcome to Mikhail Muscala, who's uh, joining the Elixir core team. He joined uh, a couple of months ago. He has made great contributions to Elixir, the Elixir ecosystem, and Erlang as well. He is one of the few people that dares go into the Erlang compiler. <laughs> um, throughout uh, Elixir's growth, we have had contributions from lots of other people. And you can see there's no numbers on this graph, but we get about six a week now. And at the beginning, we were getting about two new contributors a week. This is new contributors, first time. Uh, but it's not just about the code. There's many ways to contribute. And hopefully, you will either contribute to the Elixir ecosystem or the OTP Erlang Beam ecosystem as a whole. Um, so there's lots of ideas here. Thank you. <laughs>